and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to share with you a conversation I had with Josephine Campbell. She's the author of the book, Power Barometer, How to Manage Personal Energy for Business Success. And in this conversation, we're going to talk about managing personal energy and the crucial role that it has in managing the success that you're going to have, both individually and within teams. Josephine emphasizes the importance of addressing personal energy and the awareness of that and the impact it has on identifying roadblocks and issues that are coming up against you. We talk about the power barometer, how to check in at meetings with yourself as well as teams as to where your energy level lies and how to accommodate that, enabling individuals and team members to share your personal energy levels for better decision making, the significance of mental energy and traditional time management strategies, how those cross over together, and especially how to work together to normalize the awareness matrix when it comes to not only our energy levels, but practices and putting best practices into practice in order to not just monitor and be aware, but actually do something about choosing which work is the right work to do at which energy levels you're at. So I'm going to get out of the way and just say, enjoy this conversation with Josephine Campbell. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome to the show Josephine Campbell. Josephine, welcome to Beyond the To-Do List. Thank you very much, Eric. It's great to be here. I am so glad to have you, and I'm really interested and excited to be talking about something. I don't think we've talked about this enough when it comes to productivity. You have a brand new book out called Power Barometer, How to Manage Personal Energy for Business Success. And, you know, being around in the productivity space for a while, and the show being out for a long while, I've often heard people try to throw new phrases into the vernacular. Like they'll say productivity is more about time management than task management. I've also heard things like productivity is about energy management, not time management. Like they try to interchange all these things. And that one I think is particularly applicable here, energy management, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about your book, Power Barometer, And I'm curious, have you had people come up to you and say, well, how does a power barometer differ from, say, a traditional time management strategy? How do you see the real difference here when people are like, wait, power, energy, what does that have to do with productivity? I'm like, well, it couldn't be more obvious. And to you as well. But to them, what do you say to them? Yeah, I draw the scope triangle to them. Time, money quality. So my experience is that most managers, whether they're people managers or product managers or project managers, everybody consciously or unconsciously think within this scope of time, quality, and resources. And let's just call it money because at the end of the day, that's what they're thinking about, right? Or what we are thinking about. And and that's the fourth dimension missing here because the scope triangle origins from the time where the world was far more mechanical, the world where innovation such as the assembly line made a difference. And now we are at a different stage in history. We are at a different stage in human progression. And if you look at most companies, even if you look at their accountings, what is creating value, what is their biggest asset, and what is their biggest cost? It's people. It's brain power. So when the most valuable asset is people, people's brains, and the brain runs on personal energy, it actually consumes 20% of your personal energy, 20% is a lot. Then it confies logic not to encounter personal energy within the scope of thinking, prioritization, and making decisions. I'm curious with your background, what led you to this? Obviously, we all kind of have this feeling overall about our own personal energy. If we have any level of self-awareness, we know, oh, I'm hungry. Oh, I'm tired. You know, we've got some of those baseline, you know, broad stroke type things like I need sleep. I need food. I need to use the restroom. We've got physical awareness of different things like that. But I'm curious, how did you come across 
this kind of cross section or Venn diagram, because I like mentioning those all the time of energy and success when it comes to business and just everyday life. Yeah. So I used to be quadruple national champion in jiu-jitsu. And today I'm an executive coach. I'm also a leadership development consultant. So I work with leaders. I help and support leaders in becoming even better leaders and solving problems and dealing with whatever is in the way. And I realized in my practice that some of the tools that I have from my jujitsu practice made a lot of sense and created a lot of value. It really, really changes a lot of things once you start managing personal energy. So some of the tools I converted into business life. For people who don't have a clear understanding of some of the, like, you know, we know Karate Kid, we know Kung Fu, Jiu-Jitsu is just another one of those martial arts, so to speak. Mm -hmm. What are the specifics of Jiu-Jitsu and what are some of those lessons that you took from that or those principles that are now leading when it comes to success and leadership and the power barometer? Yeah, so Jiu-Jitsu varies from Kung Fu or the type of karate that they practice in Karate Kid from also having more judo in it. Judo is actually extracted from jiu-jitsu. So you ha- you also throw people. You do have the karate part of it, but then you also throw people. You have locks. You have this whole wrestling part of the fight as well. But actually, it doesn't matter whether I was doing jiu-jitsu or karate or kung fu because what I'm bringing to the business world from Japanese or East Asian martial arts I could probably also have brought that from Kung Fu or Shotokan Karate or some other type of East Asian martial arts. So it's the awareness of what happens within you and around you. Do you remember in Karate Kid, he has to do all these exercises that Mr. Miyake gives him, wax on, wax off, and he has to stand on a pole and and do all sorts of exercises that one could think, oh, what does that have to do with fighting? Did you watch the movie? Yes, very much a fan, especially because there's a more recent Netflix TV show that my kids and I very much enjoy. Great. So those exercises and any other mental training exercise you do in East Asian martial arts is essential to your performance. And when you are in a battle, it's an enormous amount of energy you have to use during a fight But it's also an enormous amount of energy you need to spend on being afraid and being in what I call the red zone where you are mentally hijacked if you don't know how to control that. And if you are in what I call the red zone, you are not capable of seeing what's coming behind you or what's coming next in the darkness. Because that is uh, necessary to win a battle, but it's also necessary in modern business life. You have to stay in the green zone. You have to know what's coming behind. You have to know what's coming next, even though it's dark and there's a lot of uncertainty. You just know that something's going to hit you at some point if you're not very aware and mentally agile. So you're talking a little bit here about red zone, green zone. Obviously, some people, they see that's on the cover. They've got this spectrum and they're thinking, oh, my energy levels. But I mean, it's much more, I don't want to call it complicated, but it's much more involved or deeper. There's more depth to it, I guess is a better way to put it than just red means danger and green means go. There's a lot more depth to it. Yes, that's true. So the model that I'm structuring the book around is a matrix. And it has two axes. The vertical axis is personal energy. And the horizontal axis is your cognitive capabilities, whether you are ready or hijacked. And when you are hijacked, your brain becomes like an autopilot. It's in reaction mode. It's just trying to survive. And this sounds very dramatic, but really... It happens to all of us many times during a day. It can be very subtle. Like in my case, I hate being late. I like to be on time. So if I feel like I don't have enough time, that I might be late, I can potentially get hijacked. I can be driving on the highway and I can miss the exit because I'm in the red zone. And then, of course, I'm going to be late. It's really stupid, isn't it? But that's what happens to all of us. And that's because the brain is designed to maximize our energy use. And your brain is also designed to keep you alive. 
So as soon as the brain thinks that you might be in some kind of danger or you need to preserve your energy, it's going to push you into your red zone. We have many different behaviors when we're in the red zone. We can fight, we can flight, and we can freeze. And in modern business life, it's not about punching each other, but it's about speaking a bit harshly, not saying thank you. It can be about not speaking up. Do you know these situations where someone comes at you and you're in an uncomfortable situation and afterwards you're thinking, oh my God, why didn't I say anything? But it's because you've been mentally hijacked. So your brain is not capable of speaking up because your default is freezing and keeping quiet in these moments. And then, of course, we want to be what I call ready, because when you're ready, you have your freedom and your awareness to bring about the most appropriate response to the situations that you can think of. And you can think much faster. You can see things from different perspectives. You might even be able to sense what's coming from behind and what's coming next. So that's the horizontal axis. And then you have the personal energy on the vertical axis. And that can be high and it can be low. High energy doesn't mean that you're accelerated and you're speaking very fast and you're all like, High energy can be very calm. High energy is just that you have enough for whatever you want to do. It's almost like a gas tank. Your tank is full, in other words. Exactly. And on this matrix, it's almost like the, I'm going to probably butcher it, but the Eisenhower matrix, where I think we've talked about that recently, even where it's urgent and important, where it's like some things are urgent and important, some things are urgent but not important. I'm not going to go through all four of them, but you get the gist. Yeah, yeah, I love that matrix. It's a great one. Let's talk about what it looks like and feels like to be in each of those four corners. Can you explain like what state we're in and and how that works and what it's like to be there? Yes. So each corner, each quadrant represents a mental state of mind. And there are many more mental stages of mind than four. But I've picked those four because they're representative in relation to whether you're ready and hijacked. And when the, you have high energy or low energy. So in the upper right corner, in the green zone, you have mentally agile. That's where we want to be. You picture Karate Kid at the big battle at the end of the old movie. And at that point, he is mentally agile. He's super fit. He's trained not just his techniques and his body, but also his mind, his inner self. So he can sense what goes on within him. So he can manage his emotion, his state of mind, his energy level, and he can also sense what's happening behind him, around him. That's mentally agile. Then below mentally agile in the green zone, you have mellow. When you are mellow, you're still ready. You still have a clear mind, but you are low on energy. You know, that does happen sometimes that we spend our energy, you know, sometimes at night. I'm mellow, not full of energy but I'm, I still have a clear mind. If, you know, if I'm peacefully sitting in my couch and having a good time, yeah, it can be absolutely wonderful. There's nothing wrong about having low energy at the end of the day. And then on the other side of the vertical axis, you have the red zone. In the upper quadrant, you have what I call narrow. And narrow is what often is being interpreted as being focused. We have to really, really watch out for this state of mind because very often in business life, especially if it's like this big squared guy, it's being celebrated that he's just focused and he doesn't listen or she, this person doesn't listen what other people are saying. This person only have on his or her mind what he or her is thinking about. Well, we all get to that state of mind sometimes. And then we just see what's in front of us, what we want to do, right? And if somebody else has a comment or a different suggestion, it's, it feels almost annoying, right? You just want to get there. You have a tunnel vision and your ears doesn't work so well. Sometimes it creates some problems when collaborating or leading others. And then below that quadrant, we have fragile. And I don't want anybody to be there. I'm really, really doing everything I can in my own life not to go there at all. But the reality is that there are millions of people living and working there in that quadrant, having that state of mind day in and day out for years. And they break down at some point. 
So people that we know who have been suffering from severe stress, often they've been mentally in that quadrant most of the time for years, and it, it happens too often. Now, it seems to me that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm, I'm trying to make sure that those that are listening understand this, it seems like the trouble doesn't necessarily come in between having high or low energy per se, as much as it does being in the red zone more than the green zone. Is that an accurate interpretation? Yes and no. What I'm trying to avoid is to be in the red zone. Because when you're in the red zone, you're not productive. You're just, you're spending a lot of energy. You're not doing your best work. You will not come up with great new ideas or solutions. You will not be able to hear what other people are saying. You might be able to push the ball that you're fixed on a little further, but you know, it's not really quality work. So when you're low on energy, you're more vulnerable to get hijacked. And of course you can be more productive when you're high on energy than low on energy. So I'm really, really trying to manage my energy to have high energy most of the day. And then what happens is that throughout a day, no matter how high our energy is, we do have circles of energy, rest activity cycles. So trying to acknowledge them a little bit, having a few breaks when you're in the low end of the cycle will support your energy level all over the day. So at the end of the day, you would have had more energy and you would have been more productive if we remember to respect those circles, ups and downs, and take a few pauses. And we have a lot of research that backs up the value and the increased productivity from taking breaks. You probably also had someone else on the show talking about this, I can imagine. Yes. Yeah, we've, we've talked about taking breaks often. Yeah, because it does increase productivity, and it's basically also because it's personal energy management. This was something that we were, my wife and I were trying to talk to our daughter, who is in her first semester of college, and she was home on Thanksgiving break and had some work because it's a dual program. So even though classes were done in one place, there was still some residual online work. And she was not managing her time or, or especially her energy well. She was sitting for hours at a time at a desk working on work that she needed to turn in before the end of the weekend. And I just kept telling her, you need to take a break. You need to take a break. Instead of going up and to the right, you are going down and to the right. The entire time you're sitting, you're becoming less, I want to say functional is, is what I, I don't think that's what I said. But in other words, your brain is, is leaking. You're sitting here doing the work and I applaud your focus. But if you don't get up and take a break and move around and either go I don't want to say it too loud. Go walk the dog or go get up and refresh yourself and recharge. You're pouring good minutes after bad minutes. I think I kind of got through to her finally when I explained, you know, if you have a certain amount of time that you know it's going to take you to do all of it, you can either sit here that entire time and it'll take you longer than that because as you get going, you'll have less energy and you'll get to the end and you'll have wasted two, three extra hours just sitting there or you break it in half or thirds or fourths and you do little chunks and then get up and move around and then sit back down. And it's still going to take you a little longer, but hours less than you just sitting here the whole time. Very true. It's a really good example, Eric. It's a very good example, but it's an, an example on an individual level. And really in my book, I focus on what happens in a meeting, in teams, in groups, at work, because I do think there's already been written a lot of books on what can I do for myself and manage my sleep and I can go for a walk and all that. That's been covered already. But what I was missing in the literature is what do I do as a manager to manage personal energy in my team, with my colleagues, in the meetings? We all know the feeling of leaving a meeting completely drained and we all know how unproductive that is. So what do you do about that? That is what I've been writing about. And that has my big interest because I find that there are so many managers out there to whom this resonates and they just want to get started. I hear them asking the question, OK, how? How do we get started? And I think they're also thinking, especially because the, over the course of the last few years, we've had in added in extra dimensions of 
remote work, which changes the way like right now we're talking through Ecamm as we record this conversation for the podcast and we're not physically present in the same space. So it changes that dynamic. And if you're working digitally and remotely, energy levels can be even more tricky that way. Yeah, it's consuming more energy to work remotely or hybrid than in person. It does. It does. The screen does somehow eat some of our energy. I don't know how, but I know that when we track it, because we have a heart viability rate monitor that we can use to track personal energy throughout the day, and we can see there's a difference between teams meeting and in-person meetings. And of course, you know, it depends on who are you meeting with. Are you introvert? Are you extrovert? And what is the meeting about? And so on. But meetings who otherwise would be in the green zone and pleasant, if they were in person, can sometimes have more red zone activity on a screen. And I think it's because it's more exhausting for people to sit in front of a screen all day. Definitely. Yeah. And again, that's another reason why you go to some of that other literature and you take breaks and you figure out how to integrate those with not just time, but space and selection of activity. But there are people out there leading teams or part of teams and the the collective energy is where your expertise really lies. There's leaders out there and there's individuals too who are part of teams. They're all asking right now, okay, how do we get started with protecting slash working with others and that ebb and flow and the awareness matrix? Yes. So the reason why I'm calling it the awareness matrix is because the key is to be aware. That is the first step. So having conversations about personal energy legitimizing that it's a valid factor and sharing your energy levels, which we can quantify, is a very, very good first step. So then once you are aware of what your energy level is, then you got to take responsibility for it. So, you know, we, we all know people who gives energy and we know people who drains us. And sometimes it can be the same person doing one thing or the other. <laughs> But if everybody are responsible for how they contribute to the energy at the meeting or in the collaboration, and if it becomes a norm, we will see completely different behaviors than what we are seeing many places today. So you got to take responsibility for it and then you got to act on it. So it sounds very uh, simple, right? Awareness, responsibility, and then act. That's the one, two, three. But in reality, It's both very, very efficient, it's going to increase productivity, and it's going to solve a lot of problems. But it's also going deep somehow, because when you start talking about personal energy, when you start sharing what really drains you, you will address the real roadblocks, the real issues, the real elephants in the room. So in that sense, you'll be confronted with um, the tough truth. And that's hard for people to deal with, honestly. They're either not practiced in having enough awareness to begin with. Like I was talking about earlier, oh, they have this just blanket statement of, I am aware I am tired or I am aware I am hungry or, you know, those kinds of things, but they don't know how to deal with it in a nuance kind of a way. Yeah, but I find that as soon as we start having the conversations, I do a lot of workshops on this with leaders, with teams, but also just with yesterday, I did um, a workshop with um, department leaders from big firm from different departments, but all on the same level. And as soon as we start having these conversations, they can quickly find low hanging fruits. And then what we actually spend a lot of time on is sharing those ideas that they get because I want the ideas to come from them. I can inspire, but I know at the end of the day, people are not going to do something that someone external came and told them to do. They're going to do what they came up with. So I'm doing exercises with them for them to come up with something that makes sense to them. And also because they're the experts on their everyday life. You know, No matter how smart you are, you cannot come from the outside and know more about their everyday life than they do themselves. You know, I'm a coach, so I'm coaching people, groups to come up with great ideas, things that they can actually do, share them and 
then find support systems of ways to stay engaged because people tend to be very engaged at the workshops, but we know from science that if you do uh, leadership development activities, quite often people forget it and they go back to the same old, same old. So maybe that's what you mean about that people don't know what to do about it or how to, to change it. It's easy to stay in the same pattern. So I'm always trying to encourage and, and find ways and create new systems that people start supporting each other, start collaborating about it, for it to become a norm. A norm within the company, within the team, wherever we are working. Because once it becomes a norm and you start reminding each other about it, then it's easier to go down and get that sandwich for lunch or take those five minutes break and speak to each other in a way that is not taking the energy out of the room. It actually really varies from company to company, from team to team, but it's taking people's energy. Yeah, this is why I like this, because it, it's not all about, like you said before, it's not all about the individual per se. This is a culture of a business, a way of addressing energy levels, really. One, it's normalizing awareness of it. It's normalizing then talking about it. And then it's normalizing cultural practices at the organization that allow you, like you were just giving the example of, is how do we have or how do we hold a meeting, have a gathering of whatever the goal of that meeting is for, how do we facilitate that while not all draining each other as we have that? A lot of people are like, wait, you can have a non-draining meeting? That's possible? Actually, let's talk about that specifically for a second. How do we have non-draining meetings? Like, What are some of the best practices that you found working with organizations that they've come up with solution-wise, since you're not always trying to present the solutions to them? What are some of the interesting ideas that they've come up with for their own cultures to have non-draining meetings? Well, actually, the power parameter, I wrote about it in another book. So it was a tool I came up with. But then just as I published that other book, I heard about a successful leader who was doing something similar. And she also called it the power parameter. <laughs> so she came up with the same idea as I did. And she was practicing it in her organization. And the second chapter in my book is about her. And what she is doing is in her unit, they would use the power parameter to check in on personal energy level for each individual at the beginning of a meeting. And then they would share it. And, you know, it just takes five minutes, but actually checking in on your personal energy level, it also has the effect of that you land mentally in the room where you are. You become more present, you become more aware, and you stop thinking about the next thing you have to do or the meeting you just came from. And once they were sharing their personal energy level, they would connect more with each other in the sense they would understand better what state of mind the other person that they're collaborating with or the other per people they're collaborating with and um, their state of mind. And, you know, sometimes it would lead to decisions such as there was a, an employee and his family was, they were very, very ill. And once they checked in on his energy level, they actually figured out, well, it's better you're probably not present at this meeting because you should go back home and attend to them. And then you could come back with more energy and be more productive because it's not going to be productive to have you in the meeting today. And you should go take care of your family. Uh, but they would also align with each other. So the rest of the meeting would be smoother, faster. And then they promised each other that if one of them could sense that the energy in the meeting was getting lower, they would raise their voice. Because when the energy is getting low, there's something wrong. Okay, it could be that people are drained. It could be that you just need five minutes break. It could be they're talking about the wrong thing. It could be they're talking in circles. It could be that the people who are actually supposed to make that decision is not in the room. So they shouldn't be spending so much time about discussing this topic or many other factors which are wrong. So that it should be addressed as quick as possible, not to waste time and energy. It increases the quality of the meetings. Just having the permission to do that check-in. And I know some people are thinking, uh, when we start a meeting, I don't want to go around and say where I'm at energy level wise, because it feels 
at least at first, I can see that it could definitely bolster camaraderie, but I think it's like a relationship. It's like, uh, I just met you and I don't, you know, I'm not that familiar. So me sharing personal thoughts, feelings right now isn't very helpful, but it's getting past that into the really good stuff. You're past, you, you've known them for a while and you, you're more familiar and it's, you're gelling together as a team. And so it's not an instantaneous, like, oh, this feels great and awesome, but it can get there through practice is what I'm getting the sense of. Well, you can share your thoughts and feelings if you feel like, if you're comfortable with it. But what is so wonderful about the power parameter is you don't have to share anything more than a number if you don't feel like. So you can just say, I'm on a five or I'm on a seven, I'm on a three. And it's still going to give people some information, but you don't have to share your thoughts and feelings. So actually, I was surprised about how this little exercise and tool was being received by a lot of people who are very, very factual and scientific and not you woo woo or feeling, I want to talk about my feeling types. Like, like I've done a lot of work for engineers associations and, and companies who are full of engineers and finance people who like numbers, right? And who not necessarily want to sit and talk about their feelings at a meeting. So I think talking about energy is easier than talking about feelings for most people. And it's not so confrontational unless you want to share. I think even though energy level isn't a feeling, it's something you can feel and it feels kind of emotional, especially in like in a business world or a productivity sense. Oh, I have no energy and sharing that, even sharing a number only Almost, and again, again, we want to get away from a judgment call on you or on others. If they give a low number, you would think, oh, I have a low number. It's because I spent all my energy getting all this great stuff done. But that's not really what it's perceived as, or at least what we think it will be perceived as. If I say, if we go around the room and I say, I'm a three. Oh, what's wrong with them that they're at three right now? Why can't they get their energy level higher is kind of what the defensive mechanism would be. So I just wanted to call that out there in terms of discomfort. Yes, yes, I completely see what you're saying. And I did fear that I would get those reactions. I actually expected that is what would happen, but it's not. And I can't tell you why. I'm like, I just think that people are okay with numbers. Exactly what you're describing. That's what I feared but I haven't seen it. I'm glad to hear that the experience that you've had with it is completely the opposite and it's it's been freeing, it's been helping. I think that somebody who hasn't done it yet can come into that. It's it's one of those things where it's like, we always feel we're way less productive than we are because we have so much more on our to-do list than we really should be putting there for a singular day or an hour. We're like, we think we can do so much more than we can and then we beat ourselves up because of it. That's the kind of you know productivity guilt that I'm bringing in here to kind of address a little bit. Yes, that's very true. But then if you know that you're on a three and your colleagues know you're on a three, you will be able to scope the work in a way that you will have a bigger chance of succeeding and do great. It gives them a chance, but also you a chance to kind of go into a prioritization and a triage mode of saying, you know, I know where I'm at right now. And one, I'm going to do something to address that energy level as much as possible. But two, I also can address my task load. You can shift things around, in other words, to make it work better. Yeah, or you can um, shift how you're working. Right. Yesterday, I did a full day workshop with 35 people, and then I had to drive like a long drive just afterwards. So I was really, really tired when I got back home, and I was really tired when I woke up. And it's been a long time since I was that tired when I woke up. So I was low on energy this morning. I was probably on a two. Doesn't happen often, but I was this morning. Unfortunately, I only had one meeting. Then I decided I'm going to take my laptop and I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to relax and I'm going to do some work. I'm just going to do a little bit. You know, I have some things I got to do, but then I'm just going to do something I feel like. And you know what happened? I did so much that I have to do, but I was actually very productive because I was relaxed. I was taking care of myself. I respected that I was, for one time's sake, I was on a tour or something like that. So at the end of the day, I was actually pretty productive. I, I wouldn't have imagined it if you asked me in the morning. Yeah. I'm curious. So obviously, I think one of the first places to start is just 
maybe going by a number. Do you have kind of like when we're starting to to enter in to having application of the awareness matrix, we'll start with ourselves, but then also as a group, how do you suggest we get started integrating this into our everyday work and life? I will suggest that you start with the energy aspect of the matrix rather than using the whole matrix. And I will suggest that you start being aware of energy levels and that you start sharing it. And that so you talk about it for everybody to take responsibility for the energy level and for it to become a norm of how you collaborate. You can even turn it into a working principle if you use working principles for, for how you collaborate. Then everybody can do one thing at the time to improve the energy level in the collaboration. I always recommend people just to do one thing at the time, because when you have to change your behavior or um, make new habits and improve how you do things, you will succeed far more often when you do one thing at the time. You can make a whole list, but, you know, just focus on one at the time. That's a great place to start. As we wrap up here, obviously, I think that a lot of people will benefit from actually picking up the book and starting to dive in much more deeply on this power barometer. Where can people go to find out more about the book as well as the work that you're doing? Yes, on josephinecampbell.com, Josephine spelled with an F. And there's a freebie section. If you put in your email, you can actually get the first chapter of Power Barometer for free. And you will also find other resources, other tools from the books that are available for you so you can get started right away. Perfect. We'll link up to that in the show notes for people to find very easily and jump on over to that. And Josephine, it's been great talking with you. I am excited to see the impact that this is going to make for people, not just individually, but as groups and teams and organizations. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Well, that's another podcast crossed off your listening to-do list. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Josephine Campbell as much as I did. This time of year, energy, I'm just going to go ahead and say the cliche, now more than ever. This is the time of year that this is releasing in the fall-winter time where there is less light out for a lot of us. And it can be harder and harder to manage and be aware of our energy levels. This is an important conversation to have had right now. I suffer from that. I have an issue when it comes to it's just darker out or the lack of light during the day because it's also gray out instead of sunny and warm. It's cold and dreary and I want to just bundle up and do nothing. And if you're like me, this conversation will help you start to map some of that out, figuring out what you can do how you can best get around that temporary shortcoming, so to speak. And if you know of somebody else who is like me, and if you're like me, you probably do. You know somebody else who struggles at this time with energy management. Would you do me the favor of sharing this conversation with them? Hit that share button wherever you're listening to this, in a podcast app or on the website or even over at beyondthetodolist.com where you can find the show notes. You can share from there as well. Thank you so much for sharing. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next episode.